Uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, very good morning to all of you. Um, in fact, I would like to, to start by, by, by remembering one curious detail. Um, it is a joke, I would say. It's a, something like a professional joke among sociologists that culture becomes important when, uh, when sociologists or political science professors fail to explain the world, when no theory works. Uh, with regard to, 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 to politics, then the cultural dimension becomes pivotal because it comes up as a sort of, you know, deus ex machina. Uh, I have to say that culture as a dimension uh, is pivotal in modern politics and it's been so since the Renaissance. Since the Renaissance, uh, we know that uh, humanists in Europe, in Italy, France, other countries, they entered politics. And this indicated a very important change. For instance, if you remember Thomas More in England, that was the time of trouble, a very difficult time for England and Europe. And yet we know that the relations among humanists, they transcended the boundaries of states. Erasmus becomes, Erasmus of Rotterdam becomes a friend of Thomas More. And this extends to their friendship up to Oxford, where Erasmus is invited to give lectures. They make friends in Paris, translating Lucian from Greek into Latin. Then they include in their honorable company uh, Peter Hillis, a Flemish, a Flemish uh, thinker, humanist, and the secretary of the municipality of the city of Antwerp. And we know that, in fact, that was the time when humanists allow another dimension, the voice of culture, European legacy, classical antiquity, the Renaissance, all these things, they they go hand in hand with the very difficult issues in politics. And this is how the cultural dimension becomes uh, possible. I have to say that, in fact, culture and cultural diplomacy um, becomes sometimes elusive, almost invisible, but very important during the time of war, during the time of political trouble. This is related to what I would describe as the dialectic of war and peace in Europe. And let me give you several examples. 1588, that's the year when the great Spanish fleet is crushed near England. And we know that one of the Spanish warriors barely saved his life. That was Lope de Vega, a great dramatist, a great Spanish playwright. Yes, Spain was a foe. Spain was an arch foe of England. But Lope de Vega was widely admired in England as a playwright. Spanish literature was far and away the most widespread and widely admired literature in England. Lope de Vega, Pedro Calderon, uh, Miguel Cervantes were translated, admired, appreciated, and that's how politics clashed with culture. In terms of culture, Spanish literature was second to none. Tirso de Molina, Lope de Vega were heroes in England. We know that William Shakespeare was unable to read in Spanish, and he used Thomas Shelton's translation of Don Quixote to be able to read Don Quixote, which he admired very much. He even wrote a play, Cardenio, based on Don Quixote. He wrote that play together with John Fletcher, his friend, but it didn't uh, survive uh, I have to say that this manuscript was lost, but it tells a lot about admiration and great appreciation of Spanish literature in England. Uh, another example would be Peter Paul Rubens. I think it's quite appropriate in Brussels to remember Peter Paul Rubens and his city of Antwerp. A great Flemish painter, diplomat, I would say one of the one of the founding fathers of cultural diplomacy in Europe, Peter Paul Rubens, who was not only the leading, the central figure in Baroque painting, he was a diplomat, he was the ambassador of the city of Antwerp to Spain, to England, and the Spanish Netherlands at the time was represented by Rubens in Spain and elsewhere, and we know that Spain was an enemy to Antwerp and Flanders at the time. Yet, he made friends with the Spanish elite. He was widely admired as a diplomat, as a painter. He was on very friendly terms with Diego Velazquez. They were very closely related to one another. This is how cultural ties and relations far transcended hostilities and animosities of states. It was a joke when he was stationed in England, 
uh, Rubens was approached by English diplomats who asked once, are you by any chance a diplomat who occasionally practices in painting? And the answer was no. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a painter who occasionally practices in diplomacy. But in, in fact, Rubens was a great diplomat, a great politician, and it was deeply symbolic that he was exactly in those areas where the states had no accord. It was the time of discord, and yet culture allowed some ties and dialects, some forms of dialect which were pivotal. One more example of how culture becomes pivotal during the time of political discord and how the countries would never part and would never bid farewell to one another in terms of their mutual admiration, although they could be at war. The case would be with France and Russia in the 19th century or France and Germany. Uh, in 1806, after the Jena battle, when many German philosophers and writers felt humiliated by Napoleon and Napoleonic invasion. We know that Fichte wrote his very angry lines about France, urging Germans to unite. But we know that all of them admired French culture. Fichte, like any other German philosopher of the time, used to raise a glass of champagne to France and to the Republic every 14th of July. And we know that they had their incredible admiration for the Enlightenment, for French philosophy, literature. This is how political hostility was not supported uh, by cultural animosity. Quite the contrary, culture allowed admiration, mutual recognition, whereas in politics they were foes. They were enemies. And the same with Russia. Leo Tolstoy, in his novel War and Peace, allows us to remember how Russian aristocracy uh, found themselves very unhappy to go to war with France. They admired France. They spoke French easily. They were fluent speakers of French, and they were practitioners and users of French culture, which they admired and held second to none. We remember how the knight Andrei Bolkonsky finds himself in a preposterous situation. He doesn't want to go to war with France. And this is the tragic, the tragic absurd of politics that you have to wage war against the country whose culture you love, whose culture you admire. This sort of dialectic of war and peace tells something important about what happens in the 20th century, the most troubled, the most troubled century thus far, as we know. Uh, let me remind you some curious details, and let me switch to my country. It's a small country in Europe. It's one of the Baltic states, Lithuania which is an EU member and a NATO member, and a country which has a very rich and troubled history, once having been a huge state, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, once having had a joint state with Poland, the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, once having extended from the Baltic to Black Sea. Then Lithuania became a small political actor, so to say, after the partition of uh, the Polish-Lithuanian state in 1795. You know that part of that state went to Austro-Hungarian Empire, including Ukraine, and another part went to Russia, to the Russian Empire. In 1918, Lithuania makes a comeback to history, becoming an independent republic again. In 1918, together with other Baltic states, Finland and Poland. And let me remind you one curious thing. Those countries, they very strongly felt the priority of literature and arts and culture in diplomacy. Because a small country had a unique chance to raise its voice or to receive more attention due to literature and European presence. That's why in Paris, Lithuania had the Charge d'Affaires, who then became the ambassador. That was Oskar Milos a French poet of Polish background who very strongly felt his Lithuanian background. Even without being able to speak Lithuanian properly, he accepted and embraced his new political identity, describing himself as a Lithuanian. He became very passionate about Lithuania. He delivered a series of lectures about Lithuania at the Collège de France. And finally, he became the ambassador. Well, what else can you say? Lithuania was barely known. Uh, for the French or the, or the British diplomats and cultural personalities, but Oscar Milos was a French poet, and a poet who was admired by many uh, European writers and uh, literary critics. It's a curious detail that uh, when I engaged in correspondence with Milan Kundera, Kundera wrote me that I know your country due to the F Milos 
dynasty. I admire Oscar Milos and his poetry, and I always loved Cheslov Milos, his distant cousin. So this is how cultural diplomacy, literature, and European presence in terms of culture helped a lot to acquire a higher political profile for a small country. Or another unique example, we know that Russia and Lithuania uh, were the countries that could best exemplify the political hostility. Because Russia, well, always threatened small countries like the Baltic states. But there were very deep cultural ties, very profound, I would say, forms of mutual admiration and cultural dialogue. There were Russians who worked in Lithuania until the Second World War, for instance, some eminent thinkers of Russia became professors in Lithuania, among them Lev Karsavin, who once lived in Berlin, then in Paris. Finally, he accepted the call from Kaunas, from the Tautas Magnus University, becoming professor of cultural history. He became a fluent speaker of Lithuanian. He wrote a five-volume uh, study, the history of European culture, uh, uh, story, the history of uh, European culture. And he became one of the central figures in Lithuanian philosophy and culture, one of the heroes of the humanities. Well, he shared the fate of Lithuanians when the Red Army, when the Soviet Union uh, occupied and annexed the Baltic states. After the war, he was exiled to Siberia, where he died. And in addition, in addition to people like Lev Karsavin, uh, there was a Lithuanian who was in Moscow. He was a diplomat. Finally, he became the ambassador of Lithuania to Russia. His name was Jurgis Baltrushaitis. And those of you who are from France probably know the name of Jurgis Baltrushaitis, his son. The, Jurgis Baltrushaitis, the junior, who was a worldwide famous French art historian from Sorbonne. So his father was a Lithuanian diplomat in Moscow. And he was a Russian poet. He wrote his poetry in Lithuanian and in Russian. And he was on very friendly terms with Russian symbolists, with Russian poets, Brusov, Balmont, Bloch, Bailey. And he was regarded as the fifth B, Baltrushaitis. Bailey, Bloch, um, Balmont, um, Brusov, and finally Baltrushaitis. Well, with all due respect, I would say that the four Russian poets were greater, more eminent than, than, he, than himself. But in any case, that was quite something when the political forms of dialogue were very poor, culture helped a lot. Culture started serving as a great reservoir of forms for political imagination. Um, one more important example would be other diplomats who were instrumental in diplomatic life, and they were writers culture personalities. Ignu Shainus, a Lithuanian writer who became the ambassador to Sweden, or Jurgis Savitskis. Um, sorry for engaging in name dropping. Those Lithuanian names are not very much telling to you. But in any case, Savitskis is a prominent figure. He was a wonderful Lithuanian writer who worked in Denmark. He married a Danish uh, woman. Then he was um, appointed chargé d'affaires to Finland. He established the Finnish Lithuanian society. Finally, he moved to Geneva, where he served in the League of Nations for Lithuania. And when the tragedy came to Europe, when the Second World War broke out, uh, he found himself in Geneva and described everything in his political memoir, the, burn is, uh, the soil is burning. So writers were instrumental, of course, there is a very opposite example. Some people of culture did disservice in politics, becoming admirers of Mussolini or Hitler, and we know Knut Hamsun or Gabriele D'Annunzio or Umberto Boccioni in Italy. Of course, people of culture may misuse cultural diplomacy or cultural tools, becoming admirers of fascism or uh, other dictatorial regimes. But by and large, I would say, in the 20th century, the voice of culture was critically important when politics was violent, when it was not about mutual recognition and respect. It was about how uh, to grab someone else's land, how to establish someone's rule based on tyranny, despotism, and disrespect for international law. Uh, I would say that coming to present phase, 
of European life and politics, I would say that it is pivotally important to rely on cultural diplomacy. When countries cannot find appropriate forms of political dialogue, culture helps a lot. Let me give you one more example which would be most telling. Uh, the relations between my country and Poland were very difficult in the 20th century. On the one side, both countries are sisterly or brotherly, I would say, because they would be unthinkable without one another. They had a common state. They had a shared culture for centuries. But so it happened in the 20th century that they started warring. And after the First World War, the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius, was occupied by Poland. And this poisoned the relations between the two countries. We know that uh, before the Second World War, Lithuania was described by French or British diplomats as a troublemaker, raising its voice and claiming Vilnius and big states suggesting that calm down, be quiet, Poland is a big and important country. So it happened, and you know, for the sake of stability, just be quiet. And this was a tragic conflict between two countries. And the real tragedy came when Vilnius was uh, returned to Lithuania by guess who? Stalin because the Red Army clearly felt that it was about to occupy the Baltic states, and it was better to have a larger piece of Lithuania with Vilnius, which was donated graciously by Stalin to Lithuania. So what I'm saying is, it was the time of hostility. All those centuries of friendship and common history, shared culture, disappeared overnight. It was a very strong sense of revenge, hatred, and after the Second World War, although both countries shared the dramatic fate of two inmates within the same prism of the Soviet Union, although Poland was a state and Lithuania was just part of the empire, just like a colony. But in any case, those relations were poisoned. And now I'm getting to the point. The relations were saved by culture personalities, by culture people. First and foremost, by Czeslav Milos the Nobel Prize winner, born in Lithuania, who, no matter where he lived, in France, the United States, finally he returned to Poland before his death, Czeslav Milos advocated very passionately the necessity to come to terms for both countries. The same applies to Jerzy Gedroitz, a great Polish journalist, essayist, and cultural personality who lived in Paris editing Kultura, the Polish magazine. They were powerful voices of Poland, speaking in favor of reconciliation of Lithuania and Poland. On the Lithuanian side, it was Thomas Wenslova, a Lithuanian poet, translator, and Soviet dissident, who supported Milos and Gedroic very powerfully. And that's how I would say they anticipated the political accord and solidarity and collaboration of both countries. In 1994, Poland and Lithuania reached an historic agreement about partnership, collaboration, and friendship with recognition of Vilnius as the capital of Lithuania. But I do believe that the soil was cultivated by culture people. Politics was non-existent at the time. There was no policy concerning Lithuania and Poland as two countries that should be partners. And of course, culture helped a lot. Culture in terms of cultural diplomacy. And I can tell you why. I'm not saying that cultural diplomacy is identical to culture. Cultural diplomacy is a diplomacy which allows a powerful cultural dimension. And I would say awareness of history and culture. But when Polish and Lithuanian diplomats started using cultural arguments and historical arguments, it was obvious that cultural diplomacy started working. I think that it still uh, is a very powerful argument. When it comes to some other regions, uh, it suffices to remember some symbolic figures who come to unite countries. Adam Mickiewicz for Poland and Lithuania and Belarus. Each country regards him to have been one of their own poet. Polish, Belarusian, Lithuanian. The same applies to Czeslav Milos, who is equally precious for Poland and Lithuania. In, Co in Caucasian region, in Caucasus, it's, every, it's very important to remember Sayat Nova, a poet who was born in Georgia, who was of Armenian background, who spent much of his time in, in Azeri lands, and who spoke and wrote in Azeri Turkish, Georgian, Armenian, meaning these were symbolic figures.
That's why it's very important to remember them as early anticipations of European forms of solidarity and relationship. And on the very final note, I would say that the cultural becomes the political, the political may become the cultural. These are two forms of existence that supply and support one another. But what is very important, when the time of trouble comes, when we have a very turbulent situation, culture may become a rescue. That's why cultural diplomacy is not only a great reservoir for the forms of moral and political imagination, it is an instrument, a tool of policy when politics is in deep crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Donskis, uh, for this uh, impressive and convincing uh, review of the very first uh, European cultural ambassadors. So, any questions, please, on this? Uh, okay, uh, maybe a series of three yeah. questions. Let's uh, start with you. Then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Roxandra Bosilka. I'm from Romania. I'm a PhD candidate in international relations there. And my question would be whether uh, do you consider that um, cultural diplomacy as part of soft power is relevant in a world where geopolitics and still hard, the use of hard power has uh, proven to be uh, used? Nowadays, so much. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, one more, yeah? One more question, yeah? Please. Or immediately? One yeah, one more. Yeah, please. please. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Eleni Alanya from Georgia. I'm studying at the Faculty of Politics and International Relations. My uh, question is um, uh, we have um, quite clear example of Ukraine's impact, Russia's impact on Ukraine's sovereignty and also Ukraine's uh, culture. And my question is, I'm interested, how do you think uh, does Russia has now the ability, uh, we know that uh, Russia's economy is now um, decreasing, and how do you think does Russia, Russia has now ability to impact um, on um, post-Soviet countries? like Georgia and the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will try to answer. Of course, these are very, um, I would say, multidimensional questions. It's not very easy to answer them, but I will try my best, and I will try to be very brief. Uh, concerning the first question, um, of course, cultural diplomacy is very efficient when we have the time of peace and when it's quite relevant to employ soft power, because it is a form of soft power. And I'm just afraid that when uh, geopolitics starts speaking when we when the power speaks in terms of geopolitics like right now in the case of russia uh, cultural people are forced to become someone else normally writers or public intellectuals or people in politics who have their you know background in the humanities for instance normally they would be very efficient in cultural or public diplomacy but when they are pressurized by their regimes they are forced to become human rights activists human rights uh, defenders or just dissidents, which is the case with some Russians. You know that this disgraceful letter uh, of Russian, the Russian intelligentsia, uh, which welcomed the invasion of Russia to Crimea, which was blessed by some Russian artists and intellectuals, but not everyone, not everybody saluted this. There were people who were very much uh, against this, and that's why it's uh, the time of crossroads. When the masks are off, and just people show up in their, in their genuine, uh, genuine shape, I have to say. But in any case, I agree with you. For geopolitics, cultural diplomacy is not an asset, it's a liability. And that's why against geopolitics and tyrannical states, human rights defense or dissent, political dissent is much more important uh, than cultural diplomacy. But for soft powers and democracies, countries that may be in the process of trying to find some appropriate forms of political dialogue, but they would be democratic, democratically enough, cultural diplomacy is the best tool. Concerning the second question, well, we, we see um, the posthumous grimace, the posthumous grimace of the Soviet Union, so to say. We see how the logic of the 20th century comes back, but I don't think that this is for a long term. I don't think that this is for a long time. The world will never accept that, because if we accept such politics that are offered by the Kremlin, it is uh, 
we can start playing funeral music for Europe. Because Europe is based on forms of mutual recognition, respect for sovereignty, respect for borders, respect for international law, human rights. And if we destroy these forms of politics, we are back to the, the most violent forms of the 20th century. And that's why it is not acceptable. And I'm not very um, uh, pessimistic. I don't think that this comeback of Russian violence is for a long time. I think that they, they uh, will be met with very powerful resistance of the world. And I don't think that they will have many chances to influence Georgia, because those countries like Georgia, the Baltic states, Ukraine, they, they took an historic decision. They decided to get close to Europe and not to get back to their history. Yeah. OK, maybe one or two more questions. Very quick questions, please. Uh, hello, um, my name is Giovanna. I'm a Fulbright Scholar at the at in United Kingdom. So my question is, um, how might we apply the war and peace dialectic that you just described to the global community at large, given Europe's difficult history of conquest and imperialism? How might uh, that dialectic that that dialectic apply to the Middle East without being accused of, especially Europe, being accused of uh, Orientalist reductionism? Okay, perfect. Earlier, and yes, please. Last very quick question, please. Oh, no. yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, connected with your work as MEP. So we were talking to your assistant, and uh, we found out that you are very active in cultural diplomacy field uh, while working in parliament. So if you, if you can share briefly, how are you using uh, cultural diplomacy in your everyday work as MEP? Thank you. Yes, I will try to be considering the first question. Well, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of being labeled as Eurocentric or else because I'm not. I'm not Eurocentric and simply uh, let me suggest to you that we will never understand Europe without, uh, without including, for instance, Islam, Spanish Arab legacy. You know, we will never understand Europe without Jewish, Arab, uh, Turkish legacy. It would be just absolutely preposterous to describe Europe as, you know, uh, specifically and exclusively Italian, French, English. No, it's nonsense. Without Armenia, Georgia, without Ukraine, uh, Europe would be incomplete, even impossible. Let me remind you that some great people who are embraced as classics in some uh, West European countries, they were nurtured or born elsewhere. A plethora of French painters were of Lithuanian Jewish origin, for instance. A great Austrian poet, Paul Celan, was born in Ukraine, so Chernovtsi. So that's why it's simply impossible in terms of uh, European sensitivity or European uh, memory. How can we forget, for instance, Arab, Arab Aristotelians, Arab philosophers in the, in, in the Middle Ages? So it's not about any kind of reductionism. It's just respect to the facts and just the idea that during the colonial and imperial wars, there was a cultural affinity, which was very strong. At the time when Italians, during the time of Risorgimento, for instance, hated Austrians or the French, for instance, both Austrians and the French admired Italian music and Italian literature. This is to say that this is ex exactly how it worked in Europe, when colonialism or imperialism were not supported by cultural hostilities. But of course, uh, it's very important to remember uh, that uh, Cultural diplomacy became even stronger after humanists, uh, painters, writers became part of soft power, became part of diplomacy uh, in, uh, in European life. And I think it is very important to remember this because we are suffering uh, from lack of historical memory. We tend to forget many European lessons. It is especially relevant now in the 21st century. Concerning your, the second question, how did I apply my um, chances or my instruments of cultural diplomacy as a humanist myself, as a philosophy professor, as a university person. Well, I would say that I greatly benefited from my multicultural background. I'm a Lithuanian of Jewish background, and my father was a Holocaust survivor. 
mother half Polish, half Jewish. Uh, I was raised as Lithuanian, but of course I became a fluent Russian speaker since my young days. So in a way, I am a Soviet kid, a Brezhnev era kid, but I spent much of my time elsewhere. I built my second academic career in the United States, the United Kingdom. I have my Finnish degree in addition to my Lithuanian one, and I worked a lot in Sweden, Finland, Hungary, America, England. That's why many languages that I speak, for instance, and my forms of experience, they help me a lot to understand people from other countries. Due to my central European sensitivity, I will always understand a Romanian, a Hungarian, a Polish colleague. Due to my Eastern European sensitivities, I will always understand a Russian or Ukrainian friend. But at the same time, what is pivotal, I think, is that Europe itself is I realize sometimes um, the weak sides of Europe, lack of solidarity, for instance, lack of more powerful voice in foreign politics. But at the same time, Europe is very powerful in terms of culture, cultural affinity, and a very strong sense of common history and shared cultural forms. That's why I think it is necessary to use them, and I tried my very best. But I think what is very important to let some European colleagues understand those countries that are in a very difficult situation due to their political elite or political misery. Ukraine, for instance, which is in a very dramatic situation. If we don't help Ukraine now, who will? That's the question. If we don't help Georgia, for instance, or Armenia, if we don't speak in the name of these societies that we understand because we have been through the same processes. We were in that same empire. We were in that same Soviet Union. And then our path diverged, the Baltic states becoming more successful and more quick in their accession processes. But this is just about common sense, sensitivity, and solidarity. But the same, ladies and gentlemen, applies to other forms. How can I be indifferent to African colleagues and friends? How can I be indifferent to the Middle East, for instance? This is an international awareness, is a form of international awareness. And the more cultural forms we have in terms of joint culture, language legacy, linguistic presence, literature, the better for us, the easier we would find some ways. My very final sentence would be, I know that we are very short of time, my very final sentence would be, look, politicians lack instruments. They lack imagination sometimes. They rely on very technocratic methods, not because they are you know, ill um, uh, intentioned or, 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 or else, but the problem is that sometimes politics is about how to imagine the world when you have just an outline. You don't have the world in its, uh, I would say, um, coherent form. There are some forms of anticipation, outline, and that's why politicians, they could be blind and deaf to many things that are more obvious for cultural people because they get closer to those human sensitivities. That's why the voices of writers, the voices of cultured people, they could be more sensitive and even more informed than the voices of politicians who rely on technical methods on the market. They rely on international institutions. But look what happens if international institutions suffer a crisis, which is the case now. For instance, we have the countries that simply disrespect international law. And the United Nations can do very little about it. So that's why our 100% reliance on international institutions or traditional forms of politics may fail us. <laughs>